Welcome to another episode of Same Page. I am Lynn Alcimagist, and this is my lovely wife. Sarah Alcimagist. And we're going to continue with our uh, infertility series. And today we have a guest with us. Uh, his name is Jared. And uh, we're, we're, so, we're, so we're just going to kind of dive into um, kind of like the common, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, his story with him and his wife. Uh, and then the, kind of like the common threads between their journey and our journey. So, uh, so Jared, how about you just uh, introduce yourself and tell our audience a little bit something about yourself. My, my name is Jared. Um, I'm 31. Um, me and my wife have been together for, for over five years, five and a half years. Mm-hmm. And we got married just last year during the pandemic. Um, I'm an administrative professional and I'm, we're, we're, all, we're all in this together getting through the pandemic. Um, and we've been experiencing infertility issues for the past two and a half years. Okay. okay. And, and, and how was it uh, getting married during the pandemic? Very stressful. Yes. Uh, very <laughs> devastating. Uh, too many compromises, a lot of sacrifices. Not the wedding I envisioned, mm-hmm. um, but we wanted to make it official, and that's what, that's what counted. Good for you. Good for you. Where did you get married? But just, just uh, well, at our cousin's backyard. In, very nice. In Ottawa? In Gatineau. In Gatineau. Awesome. Well, um, yeah, I can only imagine what a wedding during the pandemic um, would be like. We have a few cousins who um, went through the same things and the accommodations and definitely not what they had envisioned. But just like you mentioned, um, I think the whole point is just a union, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's that's what I came down to since there was only we were only allowed six people, but we technically had more people, but they were from afar. So they couldn't actually they could only see us. They couldn't hear us. So thank God my dad took a, a video and we did a Zoom stream for all all our other in, uh, infantees. Uh, uh, yeah, you can yeah. say them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so let's dive into it. Um, tell us a little bit how, first of all, how you found out that you guys had fertility issues, because sometimes a lot of couples don't even know until, you know, a few years down the line. And what has your story been like? Well, it was, it's more straightforward than, 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 than most. It was simply just did the research. And if you, if you've been trying to, uh, trying for over a year with no success, not even a, not even a pregnancy, then uh, you see your doctor. I, okay. it was that simple. Okay. Um, and it was just, unex- it was just, it's just, it's unexplained infertility. Okay. So you actually got a diagnosis of unexplained for infertility. Is that correct? Well, I mean, that's, that's so far the, the explanation. There's probably other factor. There's probably other factors too, that, um, it, that I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable explaining, but we ruled me out of the equation. Okay. So there's that. So it, it's just a matter of, okay, there's something going on. And we need to figure it out. And now it comes down to a waiting game, mm. uh, seeing the doctor again. So um, she'd be on pills and then um, there's nothing much I can do. That's the problem. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not overweight. Uh, I take care of myself. I run, I eat as healthy as possible and I stay at a very healthy weight. So I, I just, it's, you do everything and that's in your control. Absolutely. When you realize that the woman's the one that's carrying the child, you put all the emphasis on her. And unfortunately there comes a little bit of pressure on her end uh, uh, unintentionally um, mm-hmm. because of that, especially once you rule it out of the equation, it's 50, 50. Right. Yeah. And how do you make sure to, sub- so now um, you told us that, you know, I guess you've gone through some testing and they ruled you out of the equation, but how do you support her? Um, Mm -hmm. in that journey because it is still very 100 100 even if you know um, the the um, results sort of show that maybe it might be on the female side so how do you support Mm -hmm. and be very present with her during that journey oh it's 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 very natural for me because I'm a very pro relationship pro family person Um, you just you just ask her if 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 you need anything I'm just always there I, I promised in my vows that I would always be there no matter what, mm-hmm. I, I'd, I'd drop anything. I'd, I'd, I'd quit a job for her, basically. Okay. And just her knowing that is all she needs. Okay. Um, that's what it comes down to. Okay. Okay, good. Um, and just, it, it's just being present and knowing that you're available. Um, she's very simple that way. Right. Okay. So for you, you feel like it comes very easily to support her. Yes. Um, yes. It, 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 it doesn't, 
It doesn't take much. It's, it's, I'm more worried about when she's actually is, when she actually is pregnant and having the kid, I'm going to feel, I'm going to be in unknown territory there. Right. So Mm -hmm. it's going to be a, it's going to be a case by case basis based on how she feels at that moment and what the kid's doing and how her body's responding and all those factors. We haven't even crossed that bridge yet, but I'm excited to find out. I'm excited to find out. Nonetheless, I'm not afraid. Okay. Okay. Now, since you guys are newlyweds, basically, so how has this, uh, yeah. this situation impacted your marriage? It, wouldn't, it, it hasn't made, it, it, not substantially, mm-hmm. because you shouldn't, the constitution of marriage is very powerful. It just makes the commitment that much more official and um, connected. Okay. It, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily impact the other decisions you make. It's just the paper to, to confirm that you are, you are one and your families are in unity, essentially. It didn't really impact us in terms of that because we would have felt this way anyways because we were already going through that infertility before we were married. Okay. So that's the thing. It wasn't associated with it. It wasn't like, okay, married. It wasn't, isn't, it isn't like we had to get married in order to feel that way mm-hmm. in, yeah. in order to go through this infertility or for us to try. So because we were trying before that, they're not connected in terms of an emotional connection. Yeah, like getting married was like a continuation of your relationship and whatever um, fertility issues that you were having before, it it just obviously continued, right? It was just, that was how the timeline is. Okay, she picks the date. I respected that. I I very, very committed to it. Despite all the hiccups, I promised her that we would get married no matter what. I I don't care how small it was. I wanted that to be our date. And Mm -hmm. um, and we, we kept it. It was October October 10, 2020. So get it 10, 10, 2020. It has a nice little ring to it. And mm-hmm. I was determined to keep that date and not let the pandemic. So I said, if we can't, I refuse to let the pandemic uh, stop us. I refuse to surrender. So that's, it's, that's, I use that mentality with infertility because it's like, I'm not going to just surrender and say, oh, it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because then, then, then you're going to give up on everything else in, in life too, especially if you're going to give up on the things that are most important, then it's going to be easy to let things go that, that, that you have to do, that you're obligated to do in life. Okay. Cause then you mm-hmm. neglect things that are, that are important to do. And then you become very passive in the process. Right. right. Well, just from what you're saying, like it, it just seems that, 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 well, if, uh, I can obviously like we can only speak for yourself. Uh, um, we don't know your, uh, your wife's perspective, but at least you have, a very good outlook on life because a lot of people would see the situation and automatically think of all the negative stuff. Think of, uh, mm-hmm. and, and uh, you have that self doubt uh, and then basically asking yourself, why me? Why us? Like, why are we going through this? But instead you're flipping it mm-hmm. saying that this is just a test for us to, um, to, to test our commitment and also to honor our vows and to just keep working through yeah. this, uh, this temporary struggle. Well, that's the whole point, though, is the whole point of marriage is to say that you're there for them for better or for worse. This Absolutely. is a worse moment right now. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's, it's that simple. People have to say it's like you don't have to be married to do it. It's just that now you created a vow. A vow is pro- stronger than a promise. So if you can make a vow to someone, that mm-hmm. shows them that you truly love them. That's the whole point of, of, of marriage. It's not even if you take the religious part out of it, it comes it, the needy greedy is the vow part and actually confessing, confessing your love to that other person. And like, I only want you and here are the reasons why. Okay. So if, if you say, okay, th- this is my worst case scenario. How can we get through this? It, it's not, it's not rocket science. And unfortunately people get married for the wrong reasons. Yes, Either someone says, well, true. I only want to get married to have kids. As soon as you, as soon as someone goes in with that mindset, they're doomed for divorce because mm-hmm. someone's going in with, in with it with different expectations. And then the other one thinks, oh, this is what I wanted to get married. I thought you wanted to get married for the same thing. So it's, mm. you know, it was like getting like, first, obviously you would never be with, or the idea is you don't go into a marriage thinking, oh, eventually they'll want kids, mm-hmm. regardless of this infertility or not. You have to go into it with the same mindset and go into it thinking, okay, they're going to compromise. And I have scenarios in the back of my mind that prove to me that they can compromise. 
Okay. And, and that's, that's why I love, that's why I would love to be a marriage counselor. <laughs> yeah. You I, understand the, I understand the dynamics very well. Okay. So is that in your future you feel? I, I don't know. I, I feel like I don't think I'll ever have enough money to justify doing that, especially after having a child. Um, mm-hmm. I'd say, and I say this married to the worst case scenario, if we tried absolutely everything years down the road, we couldn't have a kid. I'd probably spend the money I would have on that kid. I would probably want, I would probably go back to school. Okay. I'd probably go back mm-hmm. to university because the, the steps to become a marriage counselor is uh, extensive. It takes about 10 years. Okay. So you got an undergrad, then you get a, a master's in psychology or counseling, depending on which university you go to. Mm-hmm. Then you'd have to do, um, in, then you get a, a master's degree in psychology counseling, and then you specialize into counseling, and then you do an internship for one or two years. Okay. So it adds up to around 10 years of training. So it's, it's almost like trying to become a doctor, but you're basically just a glorified uh, therapist. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just going to bring it back a little bit to the when you found out that um, it was sort of like official that you were having fertility issues, because um, if you guys are anything like us, um, you know, after trying, you're still very hopeful until sort of the doctor really yeah. tells you that there, there is a problem, right? And that typically comes when either the diagnosis comes of either it's unexplained fertility. Mm-hmm. Talk to us mm-hmm. about like the emotions when you found out that this was, this was an issue. Oh, it, it, the emotion was kind of um, hopeless. Like, okay, well, it only felt hopeless to me because I was, I was the man in the situation. I couldn't just trade places with her. That's the part I hate the most. Mm. I, I can't, I, I can't just trade places with her and say I'm the problem. And because of that, that's the worst it gets for me. Um, and the issue is there's no one I can talk to about it. There's no one that I know personally. I mean, other than you guys and, and the fertility support groups, mm-hmm. I don't know how, I don't have any close friends that can relate to it. So every time I talk to them, it's like talking about someone you just lost. They don't know what to say. Oh, my condolences. I don't need to hear that during this time. Give me something with more substance. And even so they're speechless. So it's like, what's the point of me diving into my emotional, um, uh, in my, in my life story about what's going on lately, if you're not going to be able to even provide any support, Mm. because they've never gone through that before right. so it, it's just kind of like i can't talk to anyone that's ever gone gone through and like and they can't even empathize so right. yeah. it's like oh i'm really sorry it's just that anyone could say that a kid could say that to you uh, uh, like it doesn't mean anything it loses its value very quickly yeah that's that's really kind of how it kind of felt so as soon as that happened so Bottom line, um, I feel like I, I feel powerless because I couldn't change places, and two, I couldn't talk to any, talk to anyone about it. So I had all these bottling up of emotions, and that I, that doesn't set well with me. Mm-hmm. Um, so you you brought up some great points mm-hmm. um, that we've also um, been through, and which is one of the reasons why we're so open about um, infertility to find those people that mm-hmm. you can actually talk to these yeah. things um, about these things, right? Um, if you could change places with a person who, um, who's never been through fertility issues and they were talking to you, right. Um, what would you say that they could say that to you to feel supported? Like what can people do or say you feel, um, to feel supported? Or do you feel like it's not even a topic? That's such a really profound question. Um, you could turn into a bunch of cliches, mm-hmm. but I feel like the most powerful expression, knowing that if you, if you never give up, um, you're more, you're guaranteed to succeed because, you know, I'm a, like, I, I believe in, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, dreams come true kind of thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like the simplest, what it comes down to my favorite quote is where there is life, there is hope, which means that as long as you keep, uh, breathing and, and fighting you're you're a living life you want to create life so the more lively you are the more that there is hope for you too okay and i think that's the only way you can kind of kind of really relate to someone that you're going through the same thing if you were to change places i i, I really don't know it's mm-hmm. such a good question yeah and, and yeah it's it's, it's 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 challenging because 
um, unless you can go through it, you don't really know the real emotions that are, that, that, that come behind it. Um, and not, and like, at least from my experience, I find that most people, um, even though they, they keep telling you all those cliches, just, just like you mentioned, um, there's yeah. just a level of, there's kind of like a lack of empathy because, uh, they, they, they uh, I believe like most people cannot really put themselves in your shoes to, to, yeah. to give you the support that you need to, to move on. And like you said, to, to keep living, to keep fighting, to yeah. still have hope, uh, to keep yeah. trying. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's very hard because nothing someone could say could just suddenly change the reality of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, doesn't matter if you need a medical intervention or not. It's, it doesn't, it, it doesn't prevent you from having to wait and it doesn't just change the situation all of a sudden. It just, it just kind of help hangs on to that hope for that temporary period of time. That's it. That's all it does really. Yeah. I mean, it's worse than grieving over a loved one, but it's still the fact that we have last life aspirations. The expression that I hate living life to the fullest. Well, if living life to the fullest means that, uh, well, I, I hear that expression. I think, well, I'm in full control but we're not in full control. Mm. Like you guys are a living testament of that. And, and, mm-hmm. and, and I think when that's going through the same thing can say, how can we live life to the fullest? I I'm supposed to have full control over like well, my life decisions and all this stuff. Like, ah, oh, we're going to take risks and everything, but we can't take risks, not even just because of the pandemic, but because there's a biological reason for it. Mm-hmm. And it, and it really, it, it seems very unfair because everyone else around us is um, well, some of us around us, uh, of our peers are having kids or some people get pregnant without even trying. And you just kind of realize to yourself, do I, I feel almost less of a person. Like I'm not meant to be a parent because of that. And it's hard not to compare yourself to that, to them in, yeah. in the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a little bit where you are in, in that journey in a sense that what kind of intervention have you guys gone through and what's next for you guys? Oh, well, she's just on a typical, um, uh, uh, for like fertility drug, you know, just, you know, to stimulate um, ovaries, uh, okay. stimulate eggs, basically mm-hmm. to create, uh, produce more eggs. Um, but it's obviously not working. So there's obviously something else going on, uh, probably anatomical, but otherwise uh, our next step is to get tested, more medical test and IUI. So that won't happen um, until, until late March. And then it'll probably le- go into April by the time we get our first IUI, but we're very excited. Okay, so April is quite soon. Um, yeah. Maybe not soon enough because we all know. Yeah, that. I know. Cause <laughs> the, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because life is life is too short, and and it's kind of a bad timing because we're moving soon. So it and that's another topic altogether. Yeah. Okay, where are you guys moving to? Uh, Le, Le Plateau. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Nice. Awesome. Um, so you mentioned uh, the pandemic. And uh, has things slowed down during the pandemic? Like, what is treatment yeah. like um, during uh, this time? I mean, the only answer I could have is that we had we had to call a month in advance. To, like, I called just two days ago, and to create an appointment for March. That's how backlogged they are. Okay. That's. I mean, there's not much to say. It's so out of our control. If we have to wait, we have to wait. Um, and I respect it because there's over 300 people in, our, in, our, in the clinic in Quebec. Mm-hmm. So there's 300 patients, like 300 couples, or I'm not sure if that's 300, in, like that's just 300 women or 300 couples. But anyways, there's a lot of people for one doctor. So mm-hmm. it, there's a lot of waiting involved. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, it's, it just seems like time going is time is going by really slow. Okay. Okay. Um, having joined the Ottawa support group, I know that's how we kind of connected with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you finding that you're, you're meeting people who are providing sort of that support that you may have been looking for in your friends? Yeah, yes, yes, I, I can to testify to that. Um, however, one thing I, I find is lacking, or at least for OFC, is because there's not a lot of men that join, like Leonard or mm. me, is that the, some of the guest speakers or the people that join, well, even in general, if they're, most of them are women, I, they're not talking about from the men's perspective. Yeah. And, and even so, I want more solid advice as to what 
what is expected of us during this time? And not just asking your spouse, but I mean, globally, what, what, is, what are women generally expecting during this infertility journey? Um, it's always about, okay, this is, these are my tests that I'm going through, but these tests, we, we can't, we can't administer the test. We can't do anything about the test. We have to wait mm. for the test. Just like you, we literally can't do anything. Mm. That's what it seems like. Yeah. Um, and, it, and, and as I said before, it's kind of cliche, like, Oh, I, I'm there for you, but it, I don't know. That, that's where it ends. Mm-hmm. Well, how can you answer that question? Like what, like for you, like, what did you need from me? during this whole process? Um, I, I just wanted you to hear me whenever I, I was talking about it and just really um, not necessarily understand because I can't make you understand. Mm-hmm. I can't make anyone yeah. understand anything. Um, but when I have to cry, just kind of just be there. Um, when I'm laughing, um, I'm a very like emotional person and a person that who connects um, with yes. the other person by talking. Um, so what I needed was listening without judgment, you know, mm-hmm. um, even if it wasn't super logical because at the time your feelings sort of take over and um, it's just like, okay, um, I hear you. Okay. You know, if I have an idea, almost like a, a yes person at the time, you know, mm-hmm. not necessarily yeah. in the whole situation um, relationship, but mm-hmm. if, if I just needed to hang out at the time, then, you know, um, you know, follow through and help me with that. If I just wanted to watch a movie. So it's just really um, be there and, and whatever I needed to do with you at that time to be present and accept that um, because yep. logic doesn't always um, go no. hand in hand with um, your emotions. Mm-hmm. So I just no, I wanted to be heard that that was pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And yeah. So as much as we, as we communicated about this topic, like I know for me, it was also very challenging uh, just in the sense that um, I think as men, naturally, we want to fix things and then feeling yes. helpless that we cannot fix this situation. Uh, then yeah. we, a lot, a lot of times we, we, we kind of regress and almost like not do anything, uh, which yeah. is obviously detrimental to, uh, to, to, the, uh, the, to the connection that you're trying to establish um, yes. with your significant other. Uh, so I know for me, like what I try to do is just, is just be there, uh, have those those difficult conversations uh pose those questions as far as you know really trying to understand how she's feeling um uh, and also um just uh just trying to almost put myself in her position as much as possible yeah. uh, that, that's very obviously very hard to do um and, yes. then, and then and then for me i really tried to do like kind of the small thing so whenever we had like an appointment make sure to be ready on time, you know, yeah. like, because it's already stressful as it is. So last thing you want to do is to, yeah. is to uh, uh, cause a, an argument just by either being late or being tardy or uh, going the wrong direction to the, to, to, to the clinic, like just small things like that. So just to try and alleviate all those stressful moments. Yeah. It's, it's easier said than done sometimes. Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's sure. I, I guess I find uh, it's, because not all not all women are as vocal as you are, Sarah. For example, right? So, <laughs> what can like it's? I mean, communication is key, mm-hmm. but it's sometimes it's not as simple. Like, okay, if she's not feeling like talking and she's not able to communicate, and it's not black and white. Well, then, how do all men connect with their spouses if they're not the ones able to carry the child, or they're not the ones able to? actually do the hard hard work <laughs> in the end if you think about it it had take accepting all these drugs and uh these these tests and the discomfort that's associated with it mm. you, you just kind of feel like you're a fly on the window and and um if 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 the communication or it's not evident as to what's expected of us this is why there's a lot of men this is why mental health is so important yeah like this should be a topic that should be already very important that should already be widespread. Mm-hmm. I totally agree with you. Um, one last question that I wanted to ask, um, not necessarily fertility related, but during this pandemic, I think a lot of um, um, couples are struggling with uh, just being at home constantly and not being able yep. to have, um, you know, just a, an out to, to, to get out, <laughs> basically. So yep. tell us a little bit how you guys connect or how you guys date if you do. Um, during this pandemic? 
Uh, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> the simplest answer is simply we, we just we just don't. Uh, she's already an inside body, and uh, I can't go anywhere because I'm laid off. So it, it's 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 just it's just rough. Time goes by really slow. We mm-hmm. just enjoy the quality. Like she's you know her love language is quality time. So we just we just spend time uh, uh, cuddling up and watching a movie when she's not working. It, it, I don't know. That's it. Okay. And okay. in the process, we save money for the house. And that's the perspective we have about it. Good. Um, that's it. Well, I'm glad to hear that you guys know, know each other's love language because that, that definitely helps you uh, at least connect a, a better, especially when you're going through these oh, difficult yeah. times. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, you have to. I think, yeah. I, I think it should be, you should be, uh, you should be, no, that's a strong word. Uh, <laughs> you should be obliged to, <laughs> to uh, listen to someone's love language. Absolutely, yeah. It's it, it should be an essential ingredient to any relationship. Okay, no, because yeah, like I know I was convinced because once Sarah told me to read this, uh, I was like, okay, you know what? Yeah. This is something I wish I would have read. Uh, actually, when we started dating, it would have definitely made yeah. things a lot smoother in our in our relationship. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Awesome. It's it's a it's a it's a phenomenon. It's it's like it's world breaking in terms of. Uh, romantic relationships there's even five languages for singles uh and for your children and there's even a love languages for your animal for your pets for okay. people that have pets too okay. so, so there's like it's, and, and how you can apply that is so interesting to me uh, i'm just v- naturally really good at uh, um interpreting it and applying it right so it's not just about how you want to feel loved but it's also about how you how they want to feel loved so it's mm-hmm. that stuff is easy to turn around it's like how would you, how would i feel if i wasn't listening to her love language right so you have to turn it around and put the put yourself in their shoes kind of like infertility but a little more less complicated <laughs> very well said awesome yeah well jared i really appreciate that you reached out to us mm-hmm. um yeah. It's such a blessing and we're honored to be able to have this conversation with you and, um, and have a male perspective of oh, yeah. what it's like in, um, mm. in your battle for, um, through fertility. Um, I know not, uh, not a lot of men just in general come forward and we really appreciated that you um, were open to have this conversation with us. So thank you. Oh, that, that means a lot. Thank you. I, I, I want to break that stigma. I want to be part of that, you know, uh, well, regional break. I don't know how to say this. I just, I want to break that stigma in this, in this part of the world. I I just, I wanted people to know that it's okay. And it's okay to cry. It's okay to feel down about it. And I've read constant, you know, I've read constant articles about how normal it is. Uh, Mm -hmm. And there's nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah. Yeah. it's like it's a natural process so it's like this is something we're supposed to have naturally and then as soon as you don't it's like evolution is playing a game on us mm-hmm. yeah you and see. and it's it, it, and and that takes that puts our mental health in in jeopardy and mm-hmm. you know this pandemic has been a lesson as to how important mental health is very true so i could probably on that note awesome yeah. all right well thank you for our viewers for watching um and uh, if Somebody wants to reach out to you, Jared. How can they find you on social media? Oh, just Facebook. Okay. I don't, what, I don't have any other platforms, so. Okay. And what would your, your name be on, uh, on Facebook? Uh, uh, Jared, so J-A-R-E-D, Broughton, B-R-O-U-G-H-T-O-N. All right. Okay. So we'll make sure to put that in the description so that if people, is that okay? If people want to reach out to you, um, can they do so? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And for viewers, if you have any questions for Jared, please reach out to them. And um, yeah, we'll see you next time. And don't forget to live your truth.